Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Apache Spark and Databricks. So before I start, just kind of show of hands, how many of you guys actually used uh, Spark or Databricks? Okay, so it's not many. So I, I, I guess a, a, a bit of a difference is though, the, my presentation actually has a lot of code. Uh, so <laughs> also on the contrary, it's a Scala code. It, I know that uh, Python is really popular, but uh, well, I, I, I was trained in Scala and I'm learning Python now, but uh, so Scala is sort of like, a, you know, my go-to language when it comes to these things, so. Uh, also, I put up this uh, boring part of AI. Actually, that's coming from the Databricks uh, CEO. He basically says, we do all these things uh, so the AI guys can take the glory. So that's what the Delta, uh, ML flow and Delta is all about. Uh, particularly uh, uh, Spark itself, it's, uh, it works in the same way. Uh, here's the agenda. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I am actually the founder and the principal of the simplicity to AI. I started this like a, uh, about a year ago. Uh, well, since uh, I'm a consultant, so it's gonna be like a two or three slides of uh, marketing, so you guys can bear that. <laughs> and after that, we'll cut right to uh, the uh, core. It's basically Apache Spark, right? The, the, it's called a unified analytics platform. And also, there's a disclaimer. I don't have any affiliations with Databricks, which uh, in my uh, uh, introduction in my company, I'll basically show you guys why I chose this platform. And, and obviously there's a, you know, something that uh, uh, problem that Nathan was facing, right? In my point of view, it does solve that problem. Obviously, then we're gonna talk about Spark, Spark actually internals, right? And there's Spark SQL, and to answer some of the questions, basically to Spark, it doesn't matter your uh, Scala, Python, R, it's treated equally because uh, well, we'll see that, right? Uh, after that is actually MLab, which is the uh, Sparks uh, machine learning framework. Uh, and there's a bunch of things that we're all familiar with, like uh, feature engineering, pipeline, uh, cross-validation, evaluation stuff, right? And uh, you see that I uh, colored uh, MLab with MLflow in the same color, because MLflow actually, it's a, a new product, uh, well, new open source uh, thing that Databricks put out. It's not a part of Spark. Uh, but it's coming out of uh, uh, Databricks, right? They are tied really together. Uh, uh, we'll see that, right? Uh, and then we'll talk about a structured streaming. That's basically, you know, when we're dealing with uh, IOTs, whatever data, right? Streaming data. And the color that's the same coded is as a delta lake. They are tightly together. How are you managing uh, basically data lake? Uh, it's old now, right? So we all know that. So del delta lake, it's... Uh, the new kid, right? And uh, I'm not sure I have time to get into uh, structure streaming and Delta Lake, because uh, kind of like when I practice it out, it, 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 without it, it takes like a 45 minutes or each, right? And uh, at the end of it, it, there's actually a demo. Basically, I'm gonna use the uh, uh, Databricks to show you an end to end. It basically, uh, it covers everything the data engineer, data scientists, and DevOps engineers can do within one platform. Uh, I mean, I've, that's the agenda, so let's jump into some of the uh, boring stuff. So, a bit of an introduction. Uh, Simplicity to AI, it basically we're a consulting company. Uh, particularly, we're a spark and the data breaks the focus, right? What we are trying to do is we're focusing a uh, full stack of machine learnings, right? We will do data engineer, uh, we'll do the uh, you know, data lakes and stuff, we'll do the machine learning. So we also do DevOps, we can actually helping you build a, a, a containers and Kubernetes to deploy the model. That's actually, nowadays it becomes a sort of challenging. And we also actually uh, use this as a lot of simplicity. I'm not sure you guys are familiar with the, 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 the book, right? Just you Google for it. Uh, it's been my model all these years that uh, for any technology adoption, these are sort of like a, philosophy you should follow, right? That's a, kind of like a, uh, the name of the company came from, right? Uh, our vision is basically, obviously we want to democratize the, the bigger data machine learning and AI. How do we do that? Uh, it seems like it's everybody's goal, right? The way that we were trying to do is, I believe we have a list of resistance way to realize the benefit of AI, basically just by using Spark and the Databricks, right? Unified, uh, we'll see how 
what the heck that means, right, eventually. And right now, we believe that a financial and a technical barrier to getting into big data and AI is really, really low. Uh, so, so just basically, that's another way of saying this is a least, least resistance, right? Before, you know, you, you got to do something, you need like a million dollars of budget or whatever. Now is no, just sign up and do it, right? That's, that's basically quick and easy. And uh, another thing I kind of get a lot is, is, hey, we don't really have bigger data, right? Can we actually do machine learning and AI? Oh, the question is yes, you can, but you probably should also start to plan your bigger data uh, sort of the strategies, right? Because without the data, uh, without a bigger data, you can't really unlock the, the benefit of it. You can have something like uh, the, the, the project that we're working on right now, actually there's no data, but we're still doing a lot of machine learnings on it. Uh, this is a sort of a, a engagement model, how we can help. Uh, so basically, first is a, I put it in the three tiers. Uh, strategic level, obviously, I mean, for some companies, whatever you do, you always have to come to this uh, roadmap strategics and basically what we can help, which is we basically say, hey, if you have a digital transformation strategy, we can basically fit uh, big data AI into that strategy. Uh, strategy. Basically, uh, the practice that we do is ITA EBOK. I'm not sure you guys heard about it. Basically, it's coming from a architectural uh, governance body uh, and also TOGAF, right? Later, uh, I actually am TOGAF certified, so I'm also seeking uh, the ITA EBOK certification, but it's sort of like a long shot. It costs a lot of money, so I kind of sing, right? And if you basically say, hey, you know, let's cut to the chase. I don't want to do all these strategic and whatever, whatever, blah, blah stuff. We can actually help you at a technical level. What does that really mean? Just that uh, any organization nowadays, you do have certain capability of doing your BIs, right? You have your report, either SQL reporting services or IBM or Oracle based, right? We actually can basically say, hey, streamline what you have and basically say, hey, here's what a you needed to extend that te uh, your technology stack into the bigger data and AI space, right? Obviously, that's basically, you know, the fancy words in modern data architecture, including batch streaming. Ultimately, you will have a data delta lake, right? And uh, having said that, uh, you also say, hey, I don't want to do all of this. It's just like, uh, you know, all talks without seeing any things, right? We actually can engage at the op operational level. What does that mean is that uh, I think Nathan mentioned the uh, machine learning uh, life cycles, right? You actually have, you know, get data, build model and stuff, right? What we actually try to say is, is in the operational level, we actually can help your machine learning uh, life cycle, embedded that into traditional software development life cycle, right? And that touches about uh, uh, ML flow, ML leap, uh, and uh, ML ops, right? ML ops is nothing fancy come from DevOps, right? And obviously the technology behind it is as the containers and the Kubernetes, right? So basically, uh, in a way, it's just, uh, uh, I guess it's the using the word of the model infer uh, inferencing, right? We can help you to infer in your model in either batch or real-time way, right? In a real-time way, obviously you can say it's a machine learning as a service, something like that. Uh, quick introduction myself. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I have three master degrees. Don't ask why. But, <laughs> uh, and also I, I guess it, I've been working in IT for 20 years now. And uh, I'm TOGAF certified, Azure certified, and uh, Databricks certified. Kubernetes certified was a question mark because uh, I was supposed to write my exams uh, this month, but uh, for the presentation, I actually delayed it a bit, right? And uh, I, at this moment, I'm working as a data engineer consultant at Enbridge Technology and Innovation Lab. Uh, that comes up the, all the marketing stuff. So we're gonna get into the uh, 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 presentation now. So this is a uh, data science life cycle diagram. I'm sure we probably saw this like many, many times, right? It's coming from Microsoft, right? The way that uh, uh, we see it, it is basically you actually have business analysts that co covers top. These are roles, right? And you have data engineers covered the right. And then you have your data scientists covered the, the, the left 
then eventually that's that's what we call in our lab is just basically the dev engineers, DevOps engineers, right? DevOps engineers' jobs are actually deploying the your models and putting your models uh, 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 into either batch or, or real time, right? Obviously, it ties to uh, sort of a CI/CD uh, stuff, right? Uh, at the moment, I, I'm actually hired as a data engineer, but I'm actually working both the data uh, engineer and the DevOps engineers. Just kind of uh, put into the context, though, we had a, a, a machine learning model that's been working like for a couple of months. Today, we finally put it into Kubernetes and uh, rendering it as a REST API, so you know the application can call it, right? So that's the kind of deal. Uh, obviously, these are roles you can play by one person, right? Obviously, then it's easy. You don't really have any problem of unifying anything because you're just one guy doing everything, right? Uh, well, traditionally, or any organization uh, seriously looking at this, you have at least the two roles, right? Data engineers and data scientists, right? As uh, Nathan was saying, they, they, they have different background and, and they, they use different tools whatsoever, right? So the reason I'm putting this up is, uh, a refreshment of what we uh, have, uh, when we've, uh, what kind of roles we have when we're dealing with uh, machine learning and big data, and how Apache Spark can help us be unified, right? So here's the uh, uh, simple sort of like a high level component diagram of Apache Spark. Uh, for those of you who don't really know the history, it's just a sort of brief, it's a, a bunch of uh, PhD students at a, uh, UC Berkeley, they were doing their PhD thesis and stuff. They started uh, Spark as an Apache open source project. And eventually, these guys uh, you know, came out and said, oh, we're gonna build up this company called Databricks, right? And, uh, and then, then they are still maintaining the open source uh, uh, commitment to the Spark. So the Spark itself actually comes with a, a Spark core and uh, including the uh, Spark uh, Data Frames API, and we're gonna have uh, we're gonna take a close look at on these, right? On top of that is basically you have a Spark SQL, which is the predominant uh, tool set that you use for you doing bigger data ETL and that stuff. And then the second part is the Spark Streaming, which is tied to the uh, 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 term that I'm not sure you guys are familiar with is called a I used to call a lambda architecture. Basically, it's a, uh, uh, we will eventually see the code why they were saying, hey, sh when you're doing streaming and when you're doing the, uh, a batch, right? They look, uh, they work similarly uh, within a Spark, right? And the third components on my lab, uh, that's the basically the machine learning framework. You you do all your uh, feature engineering, so your algorithms, or whatever, or whatever, right? Eventually. Uh, well, you can persist your model. That model can be, you know, ported to Dockernize it and ported to anywhere so you can do your inferencing. And then there's a third, uh, a fourth component. Actually, it's called GraphX. Uh, I, I briefly looked it into. I'll show you guys what it is. Uh, that I have never used it myself. And then it's a, basically the packaging. That means that uh, 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 Spark actually is extendable. As far as uh, from Databricks uh, concern, right, they are, uh, Building these uh, Databricks runtime on top of Spark uh, 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 run, uh, Spark engine, right? They actually allows you to incorporate any. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say any. Any of these uh, most common uh, machine learning frameworks actually can can run on the Databricks, right? So, and obviously underneath there's a bigger uh, uh, part of uh, this is the data source API, meaning your data can be anywhere. Right, or that's all there, but it's not all, right? You can be in uh, uh, AWS S3, Azure Data Lake, Azure Blob Storage, and so basically Spark does this separation of a storage versus compute, right? We will definitely see that uh, uh, eventually. Uh, so here's the, uh, the first one we're gonna talk about, the Spark Core. And when we talk Spark Core, I guess uh, any of you, if you either run Python or uh, uh, R, you're familiar with the concept of the data frame, right? In a Spark, uh, the data are represented in uh, using either RDD as a resilient, distributed resilient data and the data frame or data set. These three things are introduced uh, by the top, which is the year, right? 2011, 2013, 2015, right? And they are sort of the sort of the foundations of how Spark works. 
they're distributed by nature. We'll definitely see that uh, uh, in the coming slide. And I don't want to get uh, really into the, their comparisons to each one of them, but the bigger difference is the RDD, it's being sort of uh, uh, categorized as the Spark's internal uh, uh, API now. Uh, as a regular user, you shouldn't use RDD, but you know, I use it quite a lot. I find it really, really powerful. And uh, for just for doing some simple stuff though, if you are doing really the bigger data, uh, at a, one of my previous work, we were actually doing uh, billing uh, row aggregations, right? That's basically how the, the spark really shines for its distributed nature, right? And then basically the de facto uh, uh, data, data uh, type that you're supposed to be using is a data frame, right? Data frame is basically uh, uh, the, the core uh, for our spark now. And they did introduce a, a data set at 2015 so because uh, the bigger difference is that the data frames are not, ty not type safe. So basically, I guess, uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys have a, a programming background, right? If you're not type safe, that means that any arrows that you type post, right, it won't be captured at compiler time, you will catch it at a runtime, right? And the, but RDD and the data set, are, they're all type safe, which means that if, you, know, you, you, you cannot type stuff that uh, <laughs> it's not always in the type. So basically, prevents you to make a silly mistakes uh, uh, at, at a compiling time. And obviously the data set, uh, uh, from a performance point of view, there's no bigger performance benefit between data frame and a data set, but RDD does have a, 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 a performance penalty, which is you really shouldn't use it if you, your data is really large. Yes, they all, so that I, I've kind of, that's really good. So basically all these are immutable by nature. That's how Spark works. Later we will see how the uh, uh, query execution plan works. Basically, uh, that's basically, that's coming next, basically. I'm gonna. The delta of what you're talking about, does that change it or something? No, it doesn't change, that's a, that's a different topic, yeah. So, so basically, the only advantage that the data set has is because the data set is a type safe, so when you do a serialization, deserialization, you can actually do a better than data frame. Other than that, uh, there's no benefit of using data set. So once you have the data set, once you basically load your data, load your, uh, you know, user data lake or CSV file or parquet files into the data uh, frame, right? What do you do? Basically, in Spark, there's a two type of things you can do. Transform and action. I guess uh, uh, how many of you guys heard about the you know Spark's lazy, Spark's lazy, right? So basically, the Spark is uh, 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 considered a lazy uh, uh, when it's coming to the transform, which means that if you look at all the transforms, right? You have map, field, filter, union. You can have intersect, group by joins, right? Particularly joins. When you say hey, two data set, you can do many, many of these things. Nothing will happen until anything on the action side happens, uh, until the code runs in the, uh, the right side of actions. By the time that action happens, Spark actually you can start to run. So just keep that in mind. Anything that you do on the transform side, nothing will happen until you call uh, 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 the actions. You can have uh, five pages of uh, uh, like a, a, a Python or SQL code, it does all these joins or whatever, you send it to Spark, you get nothing because nothing's running. Unless you basically have to basically say, hey, collect or count or save, right? Then Spark will run, right? Uh, the one thing I highlighted here, it's aggregated by key. If you look at the signature, it's a typical. If you are say, hey, all these are uh, uh, not a need, uh, meets my needs, I want to have my own function. It basically, in Spark, it's called a, uh, you know, U, a UDAF, right? User-defined uh, aggregation function, right? You have to follow the signatures, same, right? First, it's basically sequential op, and it's co combining op, right? Then there's a, a number of uh, partitions. What it tells you is, is it's a, a distributed nature, because of any functions you have, you actually, the sequential ops, obviously, is they're running within one partition, right? And when they deal with the multiple partitions, they actually have to have a combining op, right? That's how uh, Spark uh, uh, deals uh, uh, natively uh, by distribution. Yeah, here's, a, uh, here's a basically a, a, a simple code. Uh, so basically, I have two data set, and obviously, I'm putting them into a, a 
tables, then I basically run a piece of a join, right? So really simple stuff. What this does is basically Spark actually generates uh, all these uh, uh, plans, and it actually, uh, you know, like it, it's really small, we're up to like 20 gigs. You probably don't really care, but for you're really running like 50 gig of data by one job, right? You these these thing actually determines your job success or fail, right? So that's just basically a, sort of a, a, a sample that we look at it there. So basically, we talk about the data uh, data frames and we talk about the uh, transform and the the actions, right? When when you say, hey, I have all these joins, uh, uh, group, uh, aggregations or group buys, right? You, then you basically say, hey, collect or basically save, right? What the Spark does is it generates that plan and also putting that plan into sort of the Spark's own way of saying, hey, when you have this plan, how am I gonna basically putting this to, uh, is that a pretty big echo? Uh, putting that actually into the cluster so your job can actually run in a distributed manner, right? This is basically the, the uh, 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 thing that called a DAG, right? You know, director uh, Archelic graph. So basically, the, the plan actually generates the graph. The graph actually eventually generates a task. Task actually eventually put on the uh, on the uh, worker node to actually run, right? And and this this uh, this graph on the uh, right side, it's a translation of what we saw on the previous slide. All that the bigger text, right? And later, uh, uh, when we do the demo, when we run the real time, you actually can see that every job actually Spark generates one of this. So, I guess uh, we, we know how we actually, you know, load our data. We can do stuff with it, right? And how it's going to execute it, right? This is the this is a, a simple really diagram about the cluster, right? Spark is about the distributed, right? So basically, this is what it has is it has one driver usually, and have n of these worker nodes, right? We we saw that the uh, uh, DAG eventually gets into task, right? Uh, and then there's a cluster manager. What the cluster manager does is. Uh, it's going to translate that uh, whatever that job. So basically, say, hey, you know, I, I got all these jobs and how many partitions, how many work nodes we have, right? Then you eventually put out all these uh, jobs to each one of the node. When they're done, they basically collect them all out. That's why uh, uh, the, all the Spark jobs are running in a distributed manner, right? The, the cluster, can, you can have standalone. I, actually, you can build one on your uh, Windows 10 machine. Although uh, you only get one uh, driver or one work node, right? And then you also can do Apache Meso and you can do Hadoop Yarn. And obviously you can run it in, in Kubernetes. And uh, in my, one of my previous work, we actually built our own uh, uh, Hadoop cluster, uh, Spark, cl uh, Spark cluster uh, running on Hadoop Yarn. And obviously nowadays anything can be managed, right? That's why there's the manager Spark as a service. You can get it from Databricks directly you also can get it from Azure. Uh, you also can get it from AWS. So basically, I have been running most of my stuff uh, on the Azure. And obviously, I also have a free account at Databricks, which uh, uh, the node is really, really small. So you, you can probably just, that's the purpose. You can just play with it, right? On the uh, Azure Databricks, we can actually see that even my, uh, when I'm running it, I, I'm actually running uh, Typically five nodes, right? So basically 100 gig RAM and uh, uh, 40, 50 core. Uh, that's that's how the cluster is being set up. We'll definitely take a look at it when we get into the uh, demo part of it. Uh, here's a uh, a slide that the basically there was a f there was a question about is hey languages, right? Uh, what languages should we choose, right? Uh, first of all, the in the Spark. It doesn't really matter because there was a project back uh, then. It's called a Catalyst. Uh, that's part of the Spark internal now. What it does, the Spark uh, Spark uh, supports Scala, Java, SQL, Python, and R. Obviously, not a generic R. It's a Spark R. Or Python is not a you know generic Python. It's a Py, uh, PySpark. It's a similar syntax, uh, uh, no. but you just have to basically tie into Spark framework, right? What it does is it doesn't matter how what languages you use to use, right? By the time that you're running it, the catalyst will do a code generation, basically translates whatever your code into Scala code and basically put it on the Spark cluster to run. 
So basically, uh, these are just basically showing you uh, exactly the same thing. It's done by SQL and by RDD. Basically, that's what it, the type looks like because uh, there's no string literals, right? You cannot make any mistakes, right? Uh, then basically, you can do the data frame join. So obviously, in SQL and the data frames, they're string literals, right? You can misspell or whatever. It's not going to tell you, right? And only when you hit send the job to, to the cluster, uh, like uh, three hours later, he says, oh, uh, you, 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 you had a typo, right? So basically, that, that's a type, to, uh, type safe. It does have some benefits, right? And then the last one, actually, it's a, it's a Python. So basically, uh, I don't really have an equivalent. I just copied it from one of the uh, uh, other uh, places. So basically, you can do the joins, obviously, Python. Even though you don't see the string literals, but uh, these these uh, 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 things, they're not checked at the, uh, or there's no compiling per se, right? And, and this slides also show you the, uh, how you get the data into the data frame, right? Basically, if you have CSV, this is basically say, hey, Spark, read, format, CSV, that's it. And if you have parquet, that's basically just say, say my uh, format is parquet, right? If you have uh, Avro, OCR, anything, this is basically a similar syntax. And then later, when, when we do the structure, uh, structure, uh, structure streaming, you will see the syntax is exactly the same. That's another way, you know, Databricks basically says, hey, we're unified. Basically, it doesn't matter if you're doing batch or you're doing streaming. The code, your code, the, the, the syntax are really similar. That pretty much covers the uh, uh, Spark core. So we're going to uh, look at the uh, ML Lab. So ML Lab, obviously, it's uh, 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 the uh, machine learning framework uh, within Spark. Obviously, anybody else, you have all different other frameworks, right? Uh, here, so the, the, there's a couple of uh, really important concepts is the pipeline, right? So what a pipeline does is basically uh, a, allows you to persist your, uh, the stuff that you're doing. Obviously, when we do a particular learning, right, we, we, once we have the data, we do the feature engineering first, right? We do feature engineering, and then we chose a model, right? Then eventually we want to do, hey, we want to do cross-validation. And all these are actually can be, if you're using a pipeline model, right, you can basically save all the work on the spot and then load it back later and then run from that spot. Right, that's the benefit of a, a, a pipeline uh, offers. I, I'm not sure any other uh, a framework, uh, I believe uh, other framework also has the capability, same, similar capabilities, but being a DevOps engineer, this is really key, because if you don't have this, you, you do, uh, if you have your creativity in your machine learnings, right, that's great or whatever, but you're going to give DevOps engineer a heart attack because he's going to have, he or she's going to have trouble to take the stuff that you model you build and the uh, inference is somewhere else. Because the key, I mean, uh, the inferencing, uh, it, it, it's huge differently than trainings. When you're doing the training, you have like a, a big, you have like a, a, a hundreds of gig of data. Your training uh, hardware is going to be really intensive. But once the model is built, it's just a massive formula. You can run. Later we have some examples. Basically, uh, the inference uh, code only requires like a, a hundred meg of uh, RAM and a, a, some really small uh, CPU. So, so basically that's why uh, I'm not sure you guys sure uh, read the article. Amazon actually is building a chip. They call it inferior. So the purpose of that chip is basically say, hey, forget about the uh, GPUs, forget about uh, Nvidia, whatever, right? These are for hardcore training. But if you're doing in inferencing, using GPU, you, even using the generic CPU is probably sometimes a waste, right? So here's the, uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, there's a bunch of things that uh, I guess we don't really have to get into details. There's a transformer estimator and obviously the pipeline. What, it, uh, what it, I'm trying to show here is that uh, on the left side, it's actually a persisted uh, uh, model of how you actually uh, uh, working on your uh, uh, machine learnings, right? If you basically, obviously we, we have, I, I'm not sure you guys can uh, make it out of the uh, uh, font. So basically you have a bunch of a, a, str a string indexer, then you have some imputators, and you, you, you have your uh, one hot encoders, right? Then you actually, all these are, are feature engineering part of it, right? And then we have a, a, a string indexer, uh, last one, which is the, you have to label, you have to uh, index your label. 
And uh, the, the, the last one, the step 11, is actually the algorithm. So basically, if you're following the pipeline uh, uh, model, right, you can actually stop at any, any, any one of this and persist it and come back and load it from there and it moving on, right? So here's the, actually the code the, in Scala that does uh, whatever generates the previous uh, 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 slide, right? You see that we, uh, we, we, we put our, I mean, this is probably uh, really familiar to you guys uh, in Python, but it, you know, I just feel the, the, the I should put up in the Scala, right? So basically you do your numerical uh, uh, columns, you do your categorical columns, and you basically then you do your string indexing, you basically uh, putting all your features into in there, and you, you do your one hot encoder, and then you, then you put your labels in there, right? And eventually you can do the parameters. And here I'm using the GBTR uh, uh, algorithm, so uh, regressors, that's my algorithm. And then a, a little bit of a data uh, a transformation because uh, when you load out a CSV, they don't really give you the right type for some of these uh, uh, numerical columns you needed to uh, convert them to the double or float. And then eventually you fit. Basically, that's basically the model's getting trained based on all these things, right? Eventually, you just basically say, hey, it's, it's, uh, I trained it, I'm gonna save it because I, obviously, there's a lot of work to do after you train it, right? It will co come later, but j this is basically the stages. I'm going to just save it because of you know, time for home or something, right? So this, this code produced the previous slide. So obviously, uh, continuing on, once you have the model, you gotta, you know, that's uh, what are the data sciences word, or the world is. Is that model the best model you have? Obviously it's not, right? You have to do your hyperparameter tunings. You have to, Actually, sometimes you actually have to choose a different algorithm, right? And then eventually, how do you know which was better? Uh, I think it was one question related to how you do the bias, right? So basically, you use evaluators. You use evaluators to basically, obviously, in, in, in your testing data, you use evaluators to see how good your algorithm is. But once you deploy your model, right, you're getting the real data, and that real data is being, uh, uh, being inferenced, right? you actually can put that as part of your test data. You, you use your evaluator to basically say, hey, uh, that's basically how, uh, I guess, data science detects the model drifting, right? So basically, that's all the concepts in here. So you have uh, parameters, uh, there's a two grid, and you have the evaluators. Obviously, we're doing uh, binary classifications. We use the binary classifications. The matrix is an uh, area under RC. And here we have, actually have the cross validators we're doing a, a, a three-fold. So I guess, uh, you know, just simple question. I guess uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys uh, uh, understand this code. Just this piece of code actually is gonna train this model nine times. So basically, uh, because we have uh, two, two times, uh, three times two greater in the parameters, we're actually doing our cross validation three times, right? So basically, you can see when you're training a model, it's really, really compute uh, intense. Obviously, once this is done, you actually basically say, hey, you know, I got a model, then uh, cross validator is the best, it will tell you which one is the best model. Obviously, that's not enough, and later we'll tie into another concept, it's called ML flow. It manages the list, uh, I mean, 100 times better. So, uh, so here's, a, uh, here's the structure streaming part. Uh, I'm gonna just briefly show this, because I don't think I have time to cover this in detail. The, the, uh, the, this is uh, coming out of the, uh, the Lambda uh, architecture. The only thing that, uh, uh, here's an example that basically I'm actually a streaming uh, tweet. The tweets actually is sent to a event hub, which is a Kafka a manager service using Azure. And then here, if you can see that, it's basically one line, the Spark, read stream, style format, event hub, right? If we recall the previous when we load a CSV file or parquet file, it's a, spark.read, right? Here we're just reading stream. That's basically similar syntax. Once you do this, you're getting a data frame. So however you do with your streaming data, and it's exactly how you are gonna be doing with your batch data. That's part of the, uh, the code by code unified uh, uh, analytics platform. So here's another example of, uh, here's another slide just basically briefly, so it's GraphX. 
I have never used it myself, but it's a sample. So basically, when you have a graph, obviously you have a collection of a vertex and you have a collection of a, uh, edges, right? No surprise, the vertices and edges are data frames, right? So once you build your data, uh, once you build, uh, so basically you, when you build your data gr uh, graph frame, uh, frame with a vertex and the edge, they're actually two uh, uh, related data frames. You can do whatever you want you can do to the data frames. And obviously there's some other stuff that uh, graph people also do, right? Short passes or page ranks, et cetera. Uh, with this, I'm gonna basically dive into ML flow. What ML flow is, is actually, uh, it's open source now, and it's not a part of a Spark, but it has the, because it's coming from Databricks, it has a sort of like a, a, a na na nature extension of a, a, what a Spark does, right? What a, what, a, uh, what a problem we have when we're doing the machine learning is uh, obviously we mentioned that you want to do hyperparameter training, uh, tuning. Uh, you want to change your different algorithm. Uh, sometimes you know you wanted to uh, just basically do do different stuff that actually towards the same same problem, right? ML flow actually has three things: allows you to tracking, and uh, basically also allows you to do the pro project and also do the models, right? The uh, project models are sort of like it's still in the earlier version, but the tracking is released. 1.0 released, uh, uh, yeah, this year sometime, a couple of months ago. So, which, uh, it, when I saw it the first time, I basically said, yeah, this is great, why? Because this brings, uh, what I, I, I basically uh, commented is, this brings the software engineering discipline into the data science, right? So what it does is, uh, uh, let me show you guys what it does. So basically, when you're doing any things, uh, any, any uh, sort of experiment, right? You, you obviously, you have a one goal, and then you're gonna basically change stuff, right? So basically, there's seven steps that how you enable the ML flow. And the first things you basically, you create experiment. You basically say, hey, uh, if I'm going to do a, a bad loan predictions, right? So that's, that's your experiment. Obviously, with that one experiment, you're gonna run many, many different things, right? And every time you run it, you basically say, hey, I'm gonna create a run, let's run ID, and within that run, obviously you wanna log stuff that's relevant to that uh, particular run, right? Parameters, right? And then matrix, right? And then this, uh, this last thing, uh, it's called artifacts. Artifacts is basically, uh, can be anything. Can basically, for instance, in my case, I'm actually, uh, artifacts is logging where your persisted model is. It's the past that where your model is being persisted. That's because for the dev engineers, you just basically say, hey, here's my run ID. You just deploy that guy to the production. He or she will be able to, uh, based on that run ID, retrieve where my model is persisted, then eventually put it into uh, uh, inferencing, right? Then you close it. So basically, all this at data is being collected in the server, and so you actually can see it and can compare it, right? So here's a, here's a, a sort of a, a brief example. The run itself makes no sense. It's just a practicing ML flow. Uh, when I was running, I, I did a couple of runs. So, so all my parameters are, these are all one experiment and different runs. And then you see that my, my parameters are all captured here. My matrix are all captured here. And uh, later, uh, when we get into the Azure environment, I can show you actually when you can select all these three or five things, you basically, compare your uh, inceptions or uh, accuracies or which one's better, right? If you go to your individual runs, you will obviously see all that and then you will see the artifacts. Here I just want to show you that for me, the most important thing I, want to, I wanted to persist, I wanted to put in the, uh, the ML flow uh, artifacts is, is where my model is being saved, right? Because that's the, sort of the key for uh, after all these runs, you basically say, hey, this one's the best. Okay, let's put it in production, right? How, how are you gonna do that? And then this is run ID is the key that uh, ties your CI, uh, your uh, uh, data science uh, uh, model, uh, building model selection to the CICD trains, right? CICD tool trains. Uh, so basically, we're coming to the demo time. So basically, uh, what do we, the, the, the demo is actually uh, to be really meaningful, I, I chose the data set that's coming from Kaggle. It's a 
uh, it's the advertise. You know that when you have an app, right? The shit pops up uh, ads uh, at different positions. And this is the one that basically the data itself is a 40 million records. So it's a sizable to see the benefit of the spark. And the goal is basically say, hey, with all these uh, parameters, right? Is this ad going to be uh, records? Obviously, they, they collect all this. Is that some of them are clicked, some are not, right? So we're going to basically uh, uh, the model is just basically say, hey. Or, you know, give a, give me a, a, a prediction. If I basically say like I'm app dev developer, I, I'm building a, 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 a app, right? I basically want to show my ads. Obviously, you want to call this uh, model so you can get a better uh, a, a click rate, which you, you you'll get paid, right? So that's a uh, uh, that's the the demo. What I'm trying to show you is basically this is the one tool. You, your data engineer, your data science, uh, data scientist, and the DevOps engineer can use just just do everything without a, you know, switching different uh, platforms or whatever. Right? So, oh, yeah, it's connecting. W uh, the Wi-Fi is really really bad. <laughs> See, it's connecting. <laughs> so basically, so here I have uh, six or seven different notebooks. Uh, so basically, uh, I, I labeled them a data engineer one, data engineer two, data engineer three, which is a data engineer does uh, basically bring the data uh, from the data lake to uh, uh, Spark and uh, basically running a bunch of uh, you know ETLs to clean it up. Okay, it's showing you. So, so data engineer one, I'm gonna skip because that's just basically when you're connecting your uh, 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 Databricks to data uh, data lake, you actually have to pass the credentials or whatever. There's a OAuth part of it that's basically there. So data engineer, uh, yeah, I guess it, come on. So basically, it's a bunch of Scala code. Uh, basically, uh, loads of the data uh, in CSV. We all know CSV is not the best format. So basically, does a bunch of things and save it as a, a split up the train and a, 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 a test and save it as a parquet. Because, uh, you know, parquet is a de facto uh, data, data lake uh, uh, storage format. I don't know the this is yeah the Wi-Fi is really slow. It doesn't let go of this guy. I'm gonna show you guys the data scientist part. Okay, so yeah. So the cool things that you you actually can notice that uh, this notebook is created as uh, Python, right? But it doesn't mean that it you can only run Python. You actually in here you can basically put a, a, a dollar sign and a Scala. You actually can put the same language in in the same notebook because uh, it doesn't care because uh, by the time it runs, it also uh, it's catalyst will do a code gen as in Scala. It doesn't matter which code. It sends to the Sparks, right? So basically, we read the data, and then we basically cache it. Uh, so obviously, you do, we do the features, and uh, then you basically build the pipelines. Uh, here's the part that you see that this guy here is the fit. So basically, for uh, 40 million record, uh, on my cluster, I, I, I want to show you guys the cluster, but uh, hopefully this doesn't take too long. So the cluster, I'm, you really run a, a three node or a three to eight node cluster that gives me about a, a between 50 to 100 gig of RAM and between 30 to 60 core. So that's basically the setting. Yeah, it's really bad. Let's go back to the data science one. So it took 10 minutes to do the uh, model training. And once that's trained, yeah, it's, you see it's constantly connecting. This Wi-Fi is really bad. Here's the page up and done. So basically, my first notebook stops at the after the model's been trained, right? Because it took 10 minutes. God knows if you have uh, uh, four billion records, is how long it's going to take, right? So basically, then, basically, my uh, data, data, data scientist two, so basically, is coming back and then loaded the model from the persistent model, then started doing the evaluations, right? That's basically uh, uh, how the, my how I separate all the, these uh, uh, these uh, notebooks. Obviously, there's a couple of DevOps engineer uh, notebooks. What it does is basically uh, starting to manipulating uh, your uh, your position models. So eventually, you can build a. a uh, in our case, is that we we always use uh, uh, Azure Kubernetes service. We basically deploy the model as a REST API because for this, it just makes sense. It's a, sort of like a real time, right? 
this page is going to display three ads. It's going to send it to the, the REST API says, hey, give me the, is, the, is this a, a, gonna, a user going to click or not, right? So something like that. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, I'm sorry that uh, the demo couldn't go really well, but uh, that's pretty, oh, I kind of want to show you guys the MO flow stuff too. So this is the MO flow that was at, when I was running. I just hope that it loads. Basically, this is the, the best feature that I want to show you here is uh, within all that a couple runs, right? If you select all of them, you actually can go do a comparison. You will compare your, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I, let's just do a quick two. You do that, and then uh, obviously, yeah, obviously my <laughs> area on ROC is all one, so you don't see the difference. But if you have hundreds of runs, you'll basically definitely see a, a, a graph. That's actually really cool it's because uh, uh, the hyper parameter tuning right now, it's also being automated now. The hyperloop or whatever, they basically, you, then you have to have some of them curved, so you basically say, hey, where's the, my best uh, hyperparameters gonna be, right? So that's that part. So yeah, sorry, I guess we have to cut short. So <laughs> anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs>